Chapter 9 Jim Gordon, in his unmarked squad car, heard someone he knew was Batman use police frequencies to call for patrol cars and ambulances. So it had been right, what he told Ramirez. Batman had been busy. Good. But Gordon had other things on his mind, namely the bank heist that had happened earlier that day. He'd hoped to get Batman's insights into the crime. That's why he'd wasted an hour standing next to the searchlight. But Batman hadn't shown, and that shouldn't get in the way of Gordon doing his job. So it wouldn't. He parked near a row of patrol cars. Ignoring shouts from reporters and gawkers, he entered the bank lobby. For a while, he watched the forensics crew do its job. Then he called to a detective named McFarlane and asked, We get anything from the surveillance cameras? McFarlane handed Gordon a sheaf of grainy photographs. He can't resist showing us his face. Gordon looked at the pictures. A leering clown with a scarred mask. Then he raised his eyes and glimpsed movements in the shadows near the teller's cage. Be back in a minute, he told McFarlane, and moved away. He joined Batman in the darkness. You made it. Batman nodded and peered at the photos. Him again? Who are the others? Another bunch of small timers, Batman said. Give me some of the money. Gordon went to where some $20 bills lay scattered on the floor next to Grumpy's body, scooped up a handful, and brought them to Batman, who scanned them with the gadget he'd taken from his belt. The gadget pinged. Some of the marked bills I gave you, Batman said. My detectives have been making drug buys with them for weeks, Gordon said. This bank was another drop for the mob. That makes five banks. We found the bulk of their dirty cash. Time to move in. Gordon waved the photo. What about this Joker guy? One man or the entire mob? The Joker will have to wait. We'll have to hit all the banks simultaneously. SWAT teams, back up. Gordon held up a handful of banknotes. When the new DA gets wind of this, he'll want in. Do you trust him? Be hard to keep him out, Gordon said. I hear he's as stubborn as you. That last sentence was spoken to empty air. Gordon shrugged and then went to rejoin his detectives. Alfred Pennyworth, whistling an old music hall dirty, moved through the Wayne penthouse, opening blinds, raising shades, stopping occasionally to admire the truly spectacular view from any of the windows. He went into the kitchen, placed a bowl of oatmeal and a cup of coffee on a tray, and carried it to the bedroom. He stopped in the open room and frowned at the still-made bed. Then he returned to the kitchen, filled the silver thermos with coffee, and took the elevator down to the building's garage. Seven minutes later, he parked the Wayne limo in a corner of the railroad yard, got out, carried the thermos to a rusty freight container that sat, lopsided, on concrete blocks. He got a key from his vest pocket and opened a padlock on the container's hatch, then stepped inside. A hiss. The floor lowered, taking Alfred down to the long, low-ceilinged concrete chamber he usually entered through a tunnel that led to Wayne's apartment building. But today, he thought it wise to assure himself that the elevator entrance was in working water and was pleased to learn that it was. A hundred years ago, Hiram Wayne had this room built because he wanted to experiment with a steam-driven subway train. The train proved to be a bad idea, but the Wayne family had retained ownership of the ground Hiram had used for his experiments. This chamber had been forgotten by everyone, and although Bruce had heard it mentioned by an uncle, he doubted its existence until recent excavation had uncovered part of it. Bruce sensed that it might someday be useful, and, again, with the invaluable help of Alfred and Lucius Fox, had pumped out water, reinforced walls, done everything necessary to make it hab habitable. Batman's massive vehicle sat in the center of the room, near a cluster of computers, printers, workbenches, power tools, and microwaves. Bruce sat amid the clutter, watching a television tuned to GCTV, the local all-news station. It will be nice when Wayne Manor is rebelled, and you can swap not sleeping in a penthouse for not sleeping in a mansion, 
Alfred said, pouring coffee into the thermos cap. Alfred handed the cab to Bruce and sat in a nearby chair to join his master. When the news report ended, Bruce returned to what he had obviously been doing when the broadcast had come on, stitching a gash on his arm from where one of the Chechen's dogs had bitten him. Alfred took the needle from him and said, When you stitch yourself up, you make a bloody mess. But I learned about my mistakes. You ought to be pretty knowledgeable by now, then. Alfred bu busied himself with doctoring. The problem this time was my armor, Bruce said. I'm carrying too much weight. I need to be faster. I'm sure Mr. Fox can oblige. Alfred peered more closely at the wound. Did you get mauled by a tiger? A dog. A big dog. For a while, neither man spoke. Finally... Bruce said There were more copycats last night, Alfred With guns Perhaps we could hire some of them And take, a week to take the weekends off This wasn't exactly what I had in mind When I said I wanted to inspire people I would never resort to guns Or to killing anyone These gang members are making it dangerous, Alfred Innocents could be killed by their antics And I don't want to shoulder the blame I know, Master Bruce but things are improving. Look at the new DA. I am. Closely. I need to know if he can be trusted. Are you interested in his character or his social circle? Who Rachel spends her time with is her business. Well, I trust you're not following me on my day off. Alfred hang up, held up a stack of surveillance photos he saw on the side table. They were of Rachel Dawes with Harvey Dent. And they had obviously been taken over the past several weeks, perhaps even months. Are you sure about that? If you ever took one, I might, replied Bruce. Know your limits, Master Bruce. Batman has no limits. Well, you do. I can't afford to know them. And what happens the day you find out? We all know how much you like to say I told you so. That day, Master Bruce, even I won't, won't want to. Probably.